In Beirut, armed extremists seize a plane to make a political statement. They terrorize the crew and passengers, including two U.S. citizens. As attacks increase against Americans abroad, the FBI and the CIA undertake a daring operation to arrest a hijacker and to send a powerful message to terrorists everywhere. In the 1980s, the United States faced a deadly new enemy abroad, an expanding network of terrorists targeting American interests. Hundreds of innocent people were killed in bombings, executions, and hijackings. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. As the violence escalated, the U.S. government responded with new laws, laws that gave the FBI broader powers to go after these radical extremists. This is the story of one of the FBI's first cases in the war on terrorism, a war that started long before September 11th. Hi there. How are you doing today? Thank you. June 11th, 1985. Hi there. 66 passengers, including an American university professor and his son, board Royal Jordanian Air Flight 402 from Beirut, Lebanon, to Amman, Jordan. A gang of heavily armed terrorists overpowers the passengers and crew. They force flight attendants to identify undercover sky marshals to prevent them from intervening. The lead hijacker forces his way into the cockpit and orders the crew to take off. Once in the air, he demands that the captain fly to Tunis. The captain does not speak Arabic. His co-pilot translates. The hijacker wants to force a meeting with the Lebanese ambassador and the chairman of the Arab League, Chadley Kalibi. The goal, to make demands, including the removal of 20,000 Palestinians from Lebanon. As the plane flies toward Tunis, the terrorists beat and torture the sky marshals. They appear to have complete control until the aircraft finally enters Tunisian airspace. Former member of the FBI's International Terrorism Squad, Special Agent Tom Hansen. They were denied landing uh, authority. And in fact, uh, the Tunisian authorities blocked the runways with fuel and water trucks. The main hijacker uh, had conversations over the aircraft radio with the tower. Uh, this went back and forth for an extended period of time, and he was simply unable to break the Tunisian will to allow the aircraft to land. Unable to force a meeting with Arab League chairman Chadley Kalibi, the hijacker reads his statement to the control tower. The aircraft continues to circle the Tunis airport, becoming dangerously low on fuel. The pilot convinces the lead hijacker that to avoid crashing, they must fly to Palermo, Italy to refuel. We're Flight 402 approaches the Italian airport, but the captain cannot land. The runways there are also blocked. Hey. I've got 
He informs the air traffic control that they must either allow the plane to land or clean up the wreckage. Tell it, tell it was clear. Get the, landing gear down. the tower finally complies. Once they are on the ground, the hijackers demand that the plane be refueled. Airport authorities at Palermo refuse. The Italians stall for time with a simple deception. They notified the flight deck that they had, uh, they had notified the Arab League and that they were making all attempts and felt confident that they could get Chadli Khalibi to travel from Tunis to Palermo to meet with the hijackers. The hijacker is suspicious. Why would Chadli Khalibi travel to Palermo when he refused to meet him at Tunis Airport? After an hour of waiting, the hijacker tells the tower that he will throw two children from the plane if airport authorities do not send out a refueling truck. Ten minutes later, Flight 402 is refueled and heading back to Tunis. For the second time in one day, the plane circles above Tunis International Airport. The captain tells the tower that the hijacker wants to read his statement on Tunisian radio, a state-run network. The air traffic controller responds that they cannot patch him through. They don't have the equipment. Listen, he doesn't even speak English, OK? To appease the hijacker, the captain lies to him and tells him the tower has agreed to broadcast his statement. Flight 402 returns to Beirut International Airport. Another terrorist boards the plane. He orders a few children and elderly passengers to leave. He relays a message from a superior, instructing the lead hijacker to fly over Jordan and Syria to read their proclamation. The plane again takes off. But after spending more than 24 hours in the air, the lead hijacker decides to turn back. He did not feel that they were getting a bang for their buck, so to speak. So the aircraft never went to Jordan and never went to Syria. The aircraft circles Lebanon for several hours before finally landing in Beirut. Determined to get their message across, the hijackers rig the nose of the aircraft with plastic explosives. At 9 a.m., the lead hijacker calls the tower. He vows that if 20,000 Palestinian refugees are not expelled from Lebanon by 2 o'clock that afternoon, he will kill the remaining hostages. In Beirut, gunmen rigged the cockpit of a hijacked plane with explosives. Aboard are 66 passengers, including two United States citizens and nine crew members. The hijackers tell the tower that they will kill all the hostages if the government does not expel more than 20,000 Palestinians from Lebanon by 2 p.m. FBI Special Agent Tom Hansen. Without any real notice, the passengers were ordered off the aircraft and instructed to uh, enter into the terminal building. Inexplicably, their 30-hour nightmare is over. The hijackers place hand grenades around the cabin. With the aircraft emptied and in the presence of international media, the hostage takers deliver one more emphatic statement. U.S. federal law enforcement agencies are determined to catch the hijackers. For the FBI, it is an historic moment. 
for the first time, they can legally pursue terrorists who have attacked Americans overseas, a power they had only recently acquired. In the early 1980s, Lebanon was a country ravaged by civil war. With the central government in shambles, Christian and Muslim militias clash, fighting for control. Beirut, once considered the Paris of the Middle East, is reduced to rubble. The situation further deteriorates, eventually forcing the U.S. Marines to deploy to Lebanon as part of a multinational peacekeeping force. The violence only escalates. In October of 1983, a suicide bomber detonates a truck full of explosives at the Marine barracks at Beirut International Airport. The blast kills 241 U.S. servicemen. Three seconds later, a similar bomb destroys the French Army barracks, killing 58. The bombing at the Marine barracks is the single deadliest attack on Americans overseas. Former FBI Assistant Director of the Criminal Investigation Division, Oliver Buck Revell. The uh, horrendous attack upon the Marine barracks in 83, uh, for a short time, really focused the attention of the American public on terrorism. But it, it always wandered off very quickly because there was not a belief of there being a sustained level of attack against the United States. Many Americans are unaware that several radical Shiite Muslim groups have declared a low-intensity war on the U.S. Their goal, to drive Westerners out of Lebanon. The most notorious of these groups is Hezbollah, whom U.S. intelligence agencies suspect is behind the Marine barracks bombing. The following year, terrorism continues to plague the region. Diplomacy has failed. Peacekeeping forces have proven ineffective. And the FBI only has the legal authority to monitor international terrorism. Special Agent Tom Hansen. We had no real jurisdiction to operate uh, overseas or to prosecute those who committed acts outside the borders of the continental United States. To give U.S. authorities broader international powers, Congress enacts the Comprehensive Crime Control Act of 1984. This new law allows the FBI to apply existing kidnapping and air piracy laws to crimes committed against American citizens overseas. So from that point on, any terrorist group who took an American hostage anywhere in the world, including aircraft hijackings, became the subject of an FBI investigation. The hijacking of the Royal Jordanian flight uh, violated the anti-hostage-taking statute that had been passed in 1984 uh, for the very first time, and it involved the FBI then initiating an investigation, even though the plane had never been in the United States and it was not a U.S. carrier. There were Americans on board, they were held hostage, and therefore the, st the statute was violated. Tom Hansen becomes the lead agent on the case. The actual uh, investigation regarding the hijacking of Royal Jordanian 402 uh, started off as a, a basic intelligence effort to gather as much information as possible. The FBI knows the two most active terrorist groups in Beirut are Hezbollah and the Amal militia, another Shia faction formed during the Civil War. This here is the plane. They suspect it is the Amal militia who is responsible for the hijacking. They control security at the Beirut airport, giving them access to the plane. Also, the hijackers' anti-Palestinian statements are typical of the group. Former FBI Executive Assistant Director Buck Revell. There was a dichotomy between the Hezbollah and, and the Amal in that the Amal wanted to remove the Palestinians from the south of Lebanon to um, send them back in, into Israel or elsewhere, uh, whereas Hezbollah uh, was supportive of the Palestinian movement, particularly the PLO. Both groups use extreme measures to get their message across. Three days after the hijacking of Flight 402, four Hezbollah gunmen 
hijacked TWA Flight 847 in Athens and forced the pilot to fly to Beirut. This was primarily uh, uh, an American flight. There were over 140 passengers on board, many of them American citizens. The Hezbollah made a number of demands uh, uh, in conjunction with this uh, aircraft hijacking, specifically for the release of certain uh, Hezbollah Shia prisoners, as well as certain Palestinian prisoners. Uh, demands which, of course, the United States had no control over. Uh, and of course, it was against US policy to make concessions to terrorist organizations. The hijackers forced the TWA jet to fly back and forth between Beirut and Algiers. At each stop, they release women and children. In Beirut, the terrorists decide to prove they are serious about their demands. They kill U.S. Navy diver Robert Steedham. They executed him in cold blood, threw him out on the tarmac uh, there at Beirut International Airport, which of course enraged all of us and cause us to rededicate ourselves that uh, this wouldn't stand. We would go after these people as long as it took. 39 hostages remain, all Americans. The hijackers move them off the plane and hold them at several locations around Beirut. President Ronald Reagan reacts. Terrorist, be on notice. We will fight back against you in Lebanon and elsewhere. We will fight back against your cowardly attacks on American citizens and property. Authorities consider possible diplomatic strategies. There were continuous meetings in the sit room at the White House. We were trying to come up with some basis to affect the release of the hostages. This was probably the most uh, stressful circumstance uh, during my 12 years in charge of the terrorism program. We were using every intelligence means available to us. Uh, CIA assets, technical means, intelligence from allied services, uh, through diplomatic channels. It was an all-out effort to obtain any and all information about who was holding the hostages, where they were being held, under what circumstances, and of course, uh, any information that would allow us to locate and potentially rescue the hostages. As U.S. agencies gather intelligence, 39 American lives hang in the balance. June 1985. Hezbollah gunmen hijacked TWA Flight 847 in Athens and forced the pilot to fly to Lebanon. They hold 39 passengers hostage all over Beirut. The U.S. Department of State applies diplomatic pressure, trying to secure the release of the hostages. Former FBI Executive Assistant Director Buck Revell. We were putting uh, pressure on the Syrians, pressure on the existing Lebanese government. We were using uh, surrogates such as Egypt uh, and, and Jordan. So it was really an all-out effort to use any and everyone that might have some ability to try and bring pressure on the, the, uh, the Hezbollah to release the prisoners. Finally, President Hafez al-Assad of Syria offers to negotiate with the captors and convinces them to release all 39 hostages. President Ronald Reagan gives voice to the nation's collective sense of relief. The 39 Americans held hostage for 17 days by terrorists in Lebanon are free, safe, and at this moment, on their way to Frankfurt, Germany. They'll be home again soon. This is a moment of joy for them, for their loved ones, and for our nation. With the hostages safe, U.S. authorities turn their attention to finding the hijackers. FBI agents debrief the hostages of TWA Flight 847. Special Agent Tom Hansen. Many of the passengers were shown um, photo spreads of previous uh, suspects in hijackings, kidnappings, to determine whether or not uh, any of these individuals were involved in the TWA uh, incident. Many of the passengers identified the photo that we had of the main hijacker uh, from the Royal Jordanian aircraft. Hansen learns that the lead hijacker of Royal Jordanian Air Flight 402, a member of the Amal militia, guarded hostages from the TWA hijacking. 
they gave accounts of conversations with this individual who admitted that he was one of the Royal Jordanian hijackers and asked them if they had seen the aircraft and uh, basically bragged about his, his role in that incident. Investigators have identified a prosecutable subject, but gathering information on a Beirut-based terrorist is difficult at best. At the time, a boundary called the Green Line divides Beirut into the Christian East and the Muslim West. Dwayne Dewey Claridge is a former division chief in the Central Intelligence Agency's Directorate of Operations. West Beirut was no man's land for Americans or even for many uh, Lebanese. And therefore, collecting information was extremely difficult not only for, for, the, for CIA, but also for the friendly Lebanese intelligence services. But the CIA is relentless. Embedded operatives in Beirut continue interviewing informants. Their persistence pays off. They learn where the Royal Jordanian air hijacking suspect lives. The only problem, US authorities are powerless to go after him. It just wasn't possible to coordinate with the Lebanese authorities to hand over, hand over the main subject. There, there was no specific government really in control. Terrorism continues to spread throughout the world. In 1985 alone, there are 812 incidents of international terrorism. 926 people are killed, including 23 Americans. We had so many acts of terrorism committed against U.S. citizens abroad uh, that the president convened a task force, the vice president's task force on combating terrorism, brought in cabinet level people to examine the law, the policy, and the actions of the United States to best combat terrorism and to define the roles of the various agencies so that it was very clear. And they set up means for interagency coordination. In January 1986, the task force creates the Operation Subgroup, or OSG. I'd like to be meeting you somewhere else under different circumstances, but terrorism. This interagency to go on. panel is comprised of officials from the FBI, the CIA, the National Security Agency, the Department of Defense, the Department of Justice, and the State Department. Buck Ravel represents the FBI. The OSG had two responsibilities one, to ensure that appropriate intelligence was disseminated at, on a, a full basis. Secondly, to coordinate operations against uh, terrorist targets, whether they be uh, groups or organizations or even uh, terrorist-sponsoring nations. Representing the CIA on the OSG is Dewey Claridge. Even before the creation of the OSG, Claridge had made recommendations for improving the CIA's counterterrorism operations. We had to do something very different because terrorism is a transnational phenomenon. By, what I mean by that is that an operation may be planned by a group in Syria but carried out in Rome. Now, the U.S. government, like all, all governments, is organized on geographic lines no matter what agency you're talking about. And it inhibits really getting after the terrorists. To handle that, you would create a center where the center would operate across national boundaries or across the divisional boundaries of CIA. The solution, at least for CIA, was to create the counterterrorism center to deal with a transnational problem, both in terms of geography and bureaucratic turf. The CTC unites operatives from each of the agency's divisions, enabling them to pool intelligence. Dewey Claridge is named chief of the center. It was a revolution. Never before had CIA ever organized across geographic boundaries or bureaucratic geographic boundaries on anything. This afternoon, uh, the U.S. is now in a position to take action against the terrorist threat, and the OSG is at the center of the effort. 
We were looking for a target which would do several things for us. One, we wanted to demonstrate to the terrorists in the Middle East that we had the will and the capability of going after them anywhere at any time. Second, we wanted to demonstrate the effectiveness of the new law and to have it tested in the courts. So we were looking for proactive opportunities to, to uh, essentially put on, on notice that the United States was not going to be dormant. It was going to be proactive in addressing these problems. Members of the OSG sift through intelligence on several wanted terrorists, including the hijackers of Royal Jordanian Air Flight 402 and TWA Flight 847. The problem is, None of the potential targets are accessible. That's kind of tough place to get into, but I assure you that For now, all the CIA and the FBI can do is gather information on the wanted terrorists and work to get indictments. Special Agent Tom Hansen. As most investigations go, there there has to be an element of luck, and ours came in uh, in June of 1987. The OSG learns that the Drug Enforcement Agency already has a Lebanese informant working out of Cyprus. Because of his associations, they believe he could help them locate wanted terrorists. In debriefing him, a CA operative learns the informant knows the lead hijacker of Royal Jordanian Air Flight 402. U.S. authorities may finally have the means to capture him. In the 1980s, with the growing threat of violence against Americans abroad, the U.S. government makes international terrorism a top priority. In 1986, the Operation Subgroup, or OSG, learns that a DEA informant knows the lead hijacker of Royal Jordanian Air Flight 402. <laughs> FBI Special Agent Tom Hansen, not only did he know the main hijacker, but they had shared a uh, friendship and an association over a period of approximately four years. In fact, indicated that he felt that he could get this person to travel outside of Lebanon and visit him uh, in another country. And this gave us uh, one thing that we hadn't had in the past, and that was accessibility. Former chief of the CIA's counterterrorist center and OSG member, Dewey Claridge. By getting our hands on him and bringing him back to the States and put him on trial, we would be signaling to the terrorists for the first time that we had changed our method of operation and we were on the offensive. The informant is cooperating, but he has a few concerns. I know that you... Former FBI executive assistant Buck Revell. He wanted a uh, significant uh, reward and relocation of himself and his family uh, to the United States under the Witness Protection Program. Uh, we felt uh, in, in the interagency uh, uh, negotiations that this was a reasonable request. He certainly would be at risk if he and his family stayed in Lebanon. Uh, so um, we obtained authority to do that. In Cyprus, the informant tells a CIA operative that the hijacker has left the Amal militia. The hijacker, in fact, uh, got into the drug business. Uh, he pursued this in Europe and uh, other uh, parts of the uh, Mediterranean, so was somewhat actively involved in uh, transportation and sale of narcotics. He told us that the lead hijacker was interested in doing drug deals, that he had been involved in the past in certain drug operations and he thought that he could be enticed to leave Lebanon, which was an important issue, uh, and go to Cyprus or elsewhere where he would be vulnerable for arrest on our charges. The OSG now believes the Royal Jordanian Air Hijacker is within reach. With the informant's cooperation, the CIA plants listening devices in his home to record his conversations with the hijacker. The determination was for him to go back and say, I know of a major international drug dealer who is looking to do an operation. Uh, you could bring the drugs in through uh, 
uh, Iran into Lebanon and then uh, set up an operation to supply this drug dealer, and it would be very lucrative. The plan calls for the informant to set up a meeting outside Lebanon between the hijacker and an imaginary drug dealer named Joseph. The OSG decides the meeting will take place on a yacht in international waters. We did not want any operation that we undertook to involve violations of the sovereignty of another nation. The OSG considers whether the U.S. military or the FBI should make the arrest. Here's good news for you. She just handed me a memo. Former commander of the FBI's hostage rescue team, Special Agent David Woody Johnson. The basic plan was that any, any counterterrorism operation occurred outside the United States or its territories would be handled by the military. Anything that occurred inside the United States or its territories, HRT would handle. And so now we got a situation where we, we may want to go over and grab a guy overseas to use the military teams or to use HRT. And now it had to have been debated at the, at the Attorney General Department of Defense level. And they finally described it as an arrest. So we we're going to use the hostage rescue team in spite of the fact that we're going to do it overseas. They choose the HRT because the FBI has arrest powers and the military does not. Members of the HRT are law enforcement officers trained to do hostage rescue and testify in a U.S. court of law. The idea was to try to take him alive and bring him back here and prosecute him. So I think you know, the idea was to make a bigger political statement. We wanted to make sure that uh, the terrorist groups and organizations, particularly terrorist sponsoring nations, knew that the United States had both legal authority and the will to carry out whatever operations were necessary. And we knew that it had to be done with interagency cooperation. This operation took a very long time to plan. We didn't want to violate the sovereignty of another nation. We did not want to undertake this and not succeed. That would send exactly the wrong message. Somebody the plan is ready to implement. The final hurdle is obtaining the president's approval. As I was going to Washington National Airport to uh, catch a commercial flight uh, uh, under just a pa regular passport uh, to Athens, uh, I received a telephone call in the bureau vehicle uh, from Ed Meese, the attorney general. And he uh, advised me, he said, Buck, uh, I just briefed President Reagan. It's a go. Good luck, and uh, I'll uh, talk to you on the other end. OK, I don't keep you posted. Before launching the mission, the FBI solidifies their case. We had to recontact the uh, witnesses that we had previously uh, interviewed and determine whether or not we could get a commitment from them that they would come to the United States and testify. Several passengers and crew of Flight 402 agree to take the stand if necessary. The government now has a prosecutable case. The plan, dubbed Operation Goldenrod, is set into motion. In the mid-1980s, the U.S. Congress acts to give federal law enforcement and intelligence agencies broader powers to battle the growing threat of international terrorism. September 1987, Operation Goldenrod is a go. The FBI, the CIA, and the U.S. Navy deploy assets for the arrest of the Royal Jordanian Air hijacker. The FBI coordinates their portion of the operation from a command center aboard the USS Butte, positioned in international waters 15 miles off the coast of Cyprus. Special Agent Woody Johnson is the commander of the FBI's hostage rescue team. The crew was told that they were just waiting for technical support to come out on the ship to help them correct some problems. We came off carrying gun cases. And, and other things, and we have some pretty big agents, and they don't look like normal technicians, and those don't look like normal 
you know, technical boxes. I remember having one of these young sailors say something the other way by, said, technician's right. In Greece, HRT member Special Agent Don Glasser rents the yacht where the arrest will take place. What was chosen because it wouldn't blend in. It wouldn't, wouldn't attract any attention. We made some changes to it. We actually put a satellite navigation system in and making some adjustments to that and put actually put a Loran on it. And um, it's an electro electronic navigation equipment. In the port town of Limassol, Cyprus, Dewey Claridge and the CIA team set up a command post in a hotel room. We had a communications officer with us and a lot of uh, aluminum trunks of equipment, which were passed off as photographic gear. And we had uh, uh, satellite communications back to Washington, to UCOM at Stuttgart, uh, that's the uh, U.S. Uh, mil military command at Stuttgart. Uh, and we, of course, we had communications with the Butte, with the, with the yacht, and uh, headquarters was patching. Uh, our communications through to the FBI headquarters, the White House, and whoever else. Everybody wanted to be in on this, uh, know what was going on. Under sail off the coast of Greece, the FBI arrest team alters the appearance of the yacht to protect the owner's identity. We changed the flag from a Grecian flag to a uh, to Italian flag. We changed the home port and the name on the hull, and we turned the uh, life preservers all around, which had the name of the boat on it. Former FBI Executive Assistant Director Buck Revell oversees the Bureau's command center on the USS Butte. We had uh, uh, emergency response team. We had a uh, helicopter turning up on the uh, deck, on the aft deck, ready to immediately respond with uh, uh, automatic weapons and uh, other capabilities to defend against any uh, attempt by pirates or terrorist groups to intercede in the operation. Our concerns uh, over the actual execution were uh, that we could get him uh, to the location in international waters to ex execute the arrest, but also that we could secure that arrest and that we could keep it from becoming uh, an international incident. In these type circumstances, you never know exactly what you're going to be faced with. We were dealing with a very fluid situation in Lebanon. We had to have the CIA operations in place uh, in, in Cyprus. We had to have the FBI operations in place on board the yacht, which was the intercept vessel, okay, and our, our command and control and emergency response on board the USS Butte, which was going to have to stay in international waters, but be very close by. And since we couldn't control the exact timetable, it had to be very flexible. FBI and the CIA are ready. CIA operatives tell the informant to call the hijacker in Beirut and tell him everything is in place. He needs to come to Cyprus now to meet the fictitious drug dealer, Joseph. The hijacker bought into this idea of uh, coming to Cyprus to meet uh, Joseph, who we, uh, you know, who we, uh, you know, basically manufactured as a as a big drug person. Hijacking aircraft isn't, you know, doesn't really make you much money, if any. But uh, and so he was looking to make some money. The hijacker arrives at the informant's home, where he will stay until the operation begins. We made sure that not only did he throw money around. Uh, quite lavishly when he brought uh, the hijacker over to Cyprus. But he had uh, showed him a suitcase uh, uh, full of money uh, that uh, certainly impressed the hijacker. He got the hijacker to uh, state on tape that he indeed was the chief hijacker of the Jordanian aircraft. This is something Justice Department wanted very much. The good news was that uh, the target, the hijacker, was in, on Cyprus, on schedule. But the bad news was that we had learned that the Cypriot police were looking for him because somehow he had gotten on a watch list 
of undesirables. Um, our number is uh, running around Cyprus with a warrant on him. Operatives cannot afford to have local police arrest the hijacker in the middle of the operation. The CIA decides to have the informant move himself and the hijacker into the same hotel where they have the command center set up. I felt we could take that risk because it was a weekend. And it was unlikely that the police would energize themselves uh, to run around, particularly to a high-class hotel and a new one at that, searching for this fellow. On Sunday morning, the informant tells the hijacker it's time to meet Joseph. He explains that since the drug dealer can't come to Cyprus, they need to meet him aboard his yacht. The informant's brother will take them to him in his boat. We had to have, quote, American eyes, US eyes, on the target, on the hijacker, when he boarded the boat to be to be able to tell Washington with absolute certainty that it was the target who was boarding the boat. And so one of our offices was located on the pier. Special Agent Tom Hansen. The uh, boat departed uh, with a cooperating witness and the main subject on time and headed out towards the yacht. We informed everybody on the uh, communications net of that fact and that the operation was underway. Um, we uh, That also, uh, we asked for Washington to begin to implement the extraction of his relatives uh, and near relatives, sisters, brothers, and children from various places around the Middle East, which had been part of the deal. Yeah. All right. We had a picket boat system in place to act as guideposts for the, for the uh, cooperating witness to navigate from. FBI's hostage rescue team commander, Special Agent Woody Johnson. My job is to worry about the people that are, that are working for me, and it's a concern that this is a double cross. Have they set us up? Is he, you know, going along with this thing, but they, they're sitting in a boat somewhere waiting on us, and then they're gonna come charging in on us in the yacht, and we're gonna end up in a, in a fight on the water. For now, all the FBI can do is wait. Undercover FBI agents await the arrival of the Royal Jordanian Air Hijacker in international waters 12 miles off the coast of Cyprus. FBI's hostage rescue team commander, Special Agent Woody Johnson. We pre-positioned the HRT guys on the deck, you know, openly there with the appearance that we're bodyguards for, for the drug dealer. Get that fender ready to go over. Also on deck are two female FBI agents to act as diversions and help put the hijacker at ease. The rest of us were secreted in the down below deck with a sniper in the pilot house in the event somebody shows up that, that we didn't expect. Or that these guys suddenly jump up and have got weapons and start shooting, uh, we can defend ourselves. Special Agent Don Glasser. So everything looked uh, normal in our boat, the, uh, the female agents were waving to him, beckoning him to come aboard the boat. I keep thinking this is this seems to be too easy. Is, is this guy? Have they set us up? The undercover agent um, spoke to them in Arab Arabic. Told them that uh, the boss was um, down below in the boat, taking a shower, and be up shortly. We said, well, the owner's gonna want the, uh, want him to be searched for weapons. It would only take a second. We apologize for that, but that was business. And uh, he didn't resist that. So uh, the other, uh, other agent patted him down, 
give him a quick pat down for her weapons, didn't find anything on him. Clean. Go downstairs. The other agent escorted him back to the uh, cockpit area where we, uh, he nodded to me, which was the signal that we'd execute the arrest. Major T operators came up from the cabin. He was very surprised. I'm not sure who he thought we were. He was absolutely terrified, did not resist us. We put leg irons on him and we called the ship. Agents send word of the successful arrest. All right, we're out of here. Uh, at that point, we knew that, you know, we'd done what we were supposed to do, deliver the target to the Bureau, and so we closed down the, uh, the uh, command post very rapidly, checked out of the hotel. As soon as the arrest was made, uh, we launched a, uh, a boat from the Butte. Butte is 900 foot in ship, so we're talking big. Comes up over the horizon and we came up alongside of it. And the captain was, was playing patriotic music over the loudspeaker, you could hear it. Mm -hmm. And he was flying a huge American flag off the back of it. At that point, he's, in, he's telling the crew what's going on. He said, you know, we finally were striking back and you had the opportunity to be a part of it. I'll tell you one of the things, it was, it was really a thrill and, and uh, actually kind of choked me up as when we came up on the deck, it, the, probably two, three hundred of the crew were up on the deck and they were cheering and clapping. And it just really was a uh, kind of emotional experience. The Butte immediately headed west in the Mediterranean to link up with the aircraft carrier USS Saratoga. Agents interview the hijacker aboard the Butte. The debriefing of, of uh, the terrorists was very helpful to the U.S. Uh, intelligence community and getting an overall appreciation and understanding of the dynamics of uh, circumstances in, in South Lebanon, the relationship uh, between the Amal and, and the Hezbollah, and, and the Lebanese government, uh, and also uh, the involvement of both Syria uh, and Iran in that area. We uh, transported him to the Saratoga uh, aboard military helicopter. From there, FBI agents transfer the hijacker to an S-3 Viking for the long trip to the United States. During its uh, trip, uh, back to Washington, D.C., it uh, had to perform two in-air refuelings. Uh, once, the, once the flight was completed, it, it represented the longest uh, flight from, continuous flight from the uh, uh, deck of a U.S. carrier uh, that the military had ever performed. After a 13-hour flight, the S-3 lands at Andrews Air Force Base in Maryland. The Flight 402 hijacker is immediately taken to Washington, D.C. for arraignment. In 1989, the hijacker is tried, convicted, and sentenced to 30 years in prison for conspiracy, air piracy, and hostage taking. The uh, arrest and prosecution was the, the first instance of U.S. law bringing an individual into custody overseas bringing him to the United States and prosecuting him in federal court for a crime in which neither he nor the victim uh, nor, nor the uh, act or circumstance ever touched U.S. territory. It was our hope that by carrying out such an audacious uh, act that we would send a very strong signal to the terrorists that uh, the, the game had changed, that uh, we would no longer uh, be essentially passive, but we'd be proactive in pursuing uh, them across the entire world if necessary. Operation Goldenrod was the first success of its kind in the U.S. government's new war on terrorism. 